Schools all over the state celebrated homecoming with all kinds of festivities last week. But at one charter school, the week was marred by a racist TikTok challenge. I'm Jay Locklear. And I'm Victor Mays. We'll have those stories. Plus, the Supreme Court hears a challenge to admissions policies at colleges, including Chapel Hill. It's Carolina News Today. UNCP celebrated homecoming with a week of festivities, including the annual homecoming parade through campus. UNCP's Spirit of the Carolinas marching band was joined by a wide range of student organizations and university offices, 60 entrants in all, which is a record. This year, participants were challenged with a golf cart competition, in addition to the usual floats. The winning golf cart was operated by University College as Mario Brothers. Resident Life won most spirited float and the most creative float was the Agricultural Club, who brought live goats and rabbits. The crowd on Faculty Row was also treated to the Purnell Sweat High School Marching Band. Thursday's parade was topped off by a bonfire near the stadium. Instead of a homecoming court of king, queen, and runners-up, who are all voted on by the student body, this year the Office of Campus Engagement and Leadership started a Leadership and Service Honor Society. This new 1887 society recognizes seven values identified with the university's seven founders, such as courage, integrity, and responsibility. Colleges nationwide that still engage in homecoming traditions are getting away from the king and queen idea. Many students felt like they couldn't participate based on their gender identity or because it was a popularity contest. UNCP's Assistant Director for Campus Engagement, Bailey Miller, told us that seven students who were announced at the football game will have project will have a service project in the spring. It's a pretty rigorous application process. They turn in an application with their um, service resume, their uh, co-curricular resume, and then a resume, a job resume if they would like. They also, um, their GPA will be checked. Um, then they, from the application process, they go to an interview process. And then after the interview, they go through what's called the homecoming showcase which is an opportunity very, um, for lack of a better word, pageant style, where they're asked questions about um, legacy and leadership and what they hope to leave behind here at UNCP and just to give their peers kind of a better idea of who they are as an individual. And then it is opened up to student body voting. However, we have drastically cut that. Um, it used to account for 40% of the decision making and now it only accounts for 20% of the decision making. So um, the students are still m most certainly having a say in who represents them, um, but not so much as the leadership and the, the academic excellence and those types of things. The U.S. Supreme Court is hearing two cases this week that challenge the use of race-based affirmative action and admission policies at University of North Carolina and at Harvard University. Reporter Michael Perchik talked to some of the parties involved in Chapel Hill. The energy stemming from the pit, where seniors Julia Black and Joran Biggs, leaders of the black student movement, gathered with friends. They've been following the challenge. Studies have shown that standardized testing is racially biased towards black and Latino students particularly. And so if you're being judged merely on grades and standardized test scores, which have already proven to be based on both race and class, then clearly that's not race-blind admissions. They point to the importance of diversity in the campus community, fostering an environment more representative of society. In order to have that diversity that makes more valuable the educational experience, you need to have information about just who it is that, uh, that's seeking admission into the uh, institution. That belief, backed by UNC Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz, who shared in part, our nation needs the next generation of leaders to be ready to participate in our diverse democracy by thinking critically, embracing differences, and forging common ground. The case revolves around Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, prohibiting schools from receiving federal funds from racial discrimination. It also claims the university's practice is in violation of the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of the law. Kenny Shu is an author in Raleigh and on the Board of Students for Fair Admissions, the group that filed the suit. We're trying to eliminate race-based discrimination here. No one should be surprised that we're trying to make a more colorblind 
country where race is less of a factor in our country and admissions, promotions, and hiring. Xu first became involved in challenges to Harvard's policies, alleging they were discriminatory to Asian students. That school also set to appear in court Monday. Using a new form of racial discrimination to make up for the past racial discrimination is not only unfair and unnecessary, it's also unconstitutional. A TikTok challenge involving high school students making racist comments has sparked controversy in Denver, North Carolina. The fact that the video was made at a charter school has community leaders and parents upset. Okay, Black History Month. Debbie Williams, former president of the Lincoln County NAACP, watched the video. I'm a student at LCS. It's a TikTok challenge asking uncomfortable interview style questions. What the student said next took discomfort to a new level. What about black people? Well, like, I think they're just all, should, we should go back to slavery, you know? They're Wow. Williams bristled, hearing the N-word used <laughs> and the students' laughter that followed. Take your joke back because this is reality. This is nothing to joke about. You said something that was very detrimental to the African-American community. Slavery was not a joke. Lincoln's in businessman Roger Calhoun couldn't believe it either. This is real people. They're trying to categorize. You make a video and you post it one time, it's posted a million times. That's what happened. The video that's not on TikTok now was shared on campus several times and someone took it to the school administrator. She and the chief administrator talked to me today from a conference in Raleigh. Quite honestly, the video is heartbreaking, frustrating. She sent a message home to parents calling it a racist video. These types of acts will not be tolerated, and this is not who we are. Which one do you prefer? When I saw it, I was in complete shock. Senior Chloe Croft worked with other me Lincoln too. Charter students Any acts of racism? to create posts combating the TikTok challenge video. Racism is just not OK. Since the incident, Alyssa Dulio has taken over morning announcements from administrators. She says she speaks out against discrimination. Speaking out about it instead of shoving it to the side will really help us move forward as a school. Lincoln Charter School administrators told WSOC they hope to turn the inc incident into a teachable moment. Administrators said the students in the video were held accountable for their actions but didn't provide details. In Lumberton, the high school's chapter of Future Farmers of America has brought home two national awards for their annual convention in Indianapolis. The students won for a booth they designed to recognize North Carolina's agricultural diversity. They also won a premier chapter award in the Building Communities Division. That prize was given for a service project they completed that raised money to buy bicycles for Robinson County's foster children. Six students represented the chapter at the National Convention. Yesterday, the university hosted local school children for Trick or Treat on the Quad. The Old Mainstream Academy is a charter school across Odom Road that educates students from kindergarten to fifth grade. They brought their trick-or-treaters over at 9.30 in the morning to hop them up on sweets for the rest of the day, I guess. University departments set up candy stations and UNCP first lady Rebecca Cummings had a pirate thing going on at hers. It was a fun break for staff, and fortunately, the rain held off for a few more hours. In the Florida Keys, the annual underwater pumpkin carving contest over the weekend offered a free scuba trip for two to a resort in Key Largo. 18 scuba divers participated in Saturday's competition. They carved their jack-o'-lanterns near Horseshoe Reef in a National Marine Sanctuary. 25, 25 feet below the surface, the divers created everything from sharks to jellyfish to pirate pumpkins. Curious saltwater fish were more than happy to get up close to nibble on bits of the orange gourds that floated off. Apparently, underwater pumpkin carving is a tradition of scuba communities nationwide, and there's even a certification that divers can earn. Also in Florida, a special haunted house made visitors jump with fright, but also smile in appreciation. This haunted attraction in St. Petersburg was put on by adults with developmental disabilities. Well, when it comes to Halloween here at Park, it's not just about scaring, it's about creating, motivating, and inspiring. However, this weekend, it is pretty scary. <laughs> From zombies, <laughs> to dead brides, oh, my baby! to witches, <laughs> 
and don't forget about the killer clowns. <laughs> the park haunted house is the highlight of the year for these participants. It's all about scaring people. It's really how many people we could scare. Ronnie Williams is one of a dozen to help design, create, and act in this ghostly walk through the cemetery. And I gotta tell you, this blood is pretty scary. I'm, yes. I'm hoping it's fake, right? Yes, it's fake, it's <laughs> fake, it's fake, it's fake. You're gonna ride a horse, maybe? Yeah. And then scream at him. Brian Rothy, assistant vice president of adult community programs, says he knew the haunted house would be fun, but never realized the life skills it would also add. An awesome team building experience. It's it has a social component to it. There's a lot of organizing that's going on. There's a lot of planning that has to happen. There's a lot of inventory lists that we have to make and our participants are taking an active role in that. I dreamed about being a killer clown ever since I was like a preteen. So <laughs> it's kind of fun and it's kind of gruesome and spooky and scary and bleh. And this weekend they'll have a chance to put all their hard work to the test as they invite family to visit if they dare. Are you excited to scare your friends and family this weekend? Yes. Are they going to recognize you with all this blood? No. Of all the other scary characters, who are you the most afraid of? The wolf. Brian hopes the community appreciates how dedicated their cast of characters are. The best part for me is the way that they talk about it throughout the entire year, at how excited they are, the smiles, the stories. Halloween observances in South Korea turn somber for a crowd gets out of control in their capital city. And controversy grips the UNC Charlotte campus over graphic images at a public protest. State officials report a case of bird flu in the suburbs. But we've also got the heartwarming story of a college football team's emotional support animal. Stay tuned. The 2016 graduate of UNC Pembroke with a degree in chemistry, Kennedy Stewart Henry went on to earn her Doctor of Dental Medicine degree from the East Carolina University School of Dental Medicine in May. Having recently completed her residency in advanced education in general dentistry at ECU, Kennedy returned home to her hometown of Hamlet to begin her practice. I'm very proud and very uh, thankful, and but it also makes me very humbled because I feel like there are so many other people that I feel like are doing a great job as well and doing great things in their community, but it means the world to me. UNCP had a really huge impact on my life, and so I'm honored to be chosen. A week of mourning is underway in South Korea, following one of the country's deadliest disasters. At least 155 people have died after a crush of Halloween partygoers in the streets of Seoul. 26 foreign nationals are among the dead, including two Americans on semester abroad. Witnesses say the narrow streets of the nightlife district were jammed with people just trying to enjoy their first Halloween weekend in years without COVID restrictions. A crowd surge left some people trampled and some crushed against walls and buildings. Officials are investigating the city's crowd control abilities. A backyard chicken flock in Wake County has tested positive for avian influenza. It's the first confirmed positive in a backyard flock in North Carolina. Earlier this year, the virus was found at, a nine, at nine poultry farms in Johnston and Wayne counties. This bird flu is considered a low risk to humans, but is highly contagious to other birds, including the commercial supply, although it does not enter the meat itself. The Department of Agriculture urges farmers and hobbyists to follow strict protocols to keep their birds enclosed without access to wild birds, where the virus is naturally occurring. The flock in Wake County will be destroyed as a preventative measure. A group that refers to abortion as genocide caused controversy at UNC Charlotte last week when they put up posters of aborted fetuses outside on campus. The group calls itself Center for Bioethical Reform. As Caroline Hicks reports, many students wanted the images removed without delay. UNC Charlotte senior Holly Mitchell snapped this photo as she approached the student union on Wednesday. It says, warning, genocide photos ahead. We are choosing to blur those images set up on display due to their graphic nature. Comparing abortion to the Holocaust, to the genocide of Native Americans, they were trying to shove flyers into people's hands. I heard them use racial slurs. Student Phoenix Rising says she was also appalled by the images, so she called the campus safety emergency line. 
They want to tell us that that's their First Amendment right. According to a spokesperson for the university, the university has established protocols to create and sustain an environment where freedom of speech and expression is supported regardless of the viewpoint of the speaker. Also saying... University leaders are aware of the alleged harassment claims circulating on social media. However, no police reports or incident reports substantiating behavior that would constitute unprotected speech have been received at this time. Dr. John Cox, who teaches Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Studies, disagrees. The First Amendment, that really does not mean that everyone has the right to say or do whatever they want. If that's what it meant, then... I guess UNCC would have to invite the Klan or the Nazi party to come and set up a gigantic display for three days. He says emails from traumatized students are pouring in, so he's calling for action. Someone should be fired for what happened yesterday. This is too much. The North Carolina Department, Department of Commerce has awarded multi-million dollar rebates to two new movies that are shooting in the state. Combined, the projects are expected to generate spending of about $30 million and create 1,500 job opportunities. A feature film adaptation of the novel, The Supremes at Earl's All You Can Eat, is currently underway in New Hanover County. An independent film called Mother Couch has started shooting in the greater Charlotte area. The production companies receive no money up front, but are paid after in-state spending requirements are met. A Nevada woman has produced prototypes of her inventions aimed at stopping domestic violence and detecting date rape jug drugs. They look like ordinary cosmetic applications. Here's more from KTNV in Las Vegas. Abusers are smart and a lot of them are career criminals. They literally are in relationships in order to control and violate. On what would have been her 72nd birthday, October 28th, Marsha Hoover is being remembered as an inspiration. It's our personal experience of actually the loss of my husband's mother. Her, her final words were actually in a 911 phone call. She was experiencing violence her entire life. By her daughter-in-law, Joy Hoover, who launched a protective lipstick called SOS and an app for women who can't get the help they need. We really truly believe if my mother-in-law had this product, that her life could have been saved. And so not only for her, but also for our little girls who are five and nine years old, just to be able to go out and feel safe and confident. In the app, you can find what looks like a regular cosmetics website. But with a press of a button, the safe mode is activated and you can customize instructions from you to a loved one or police that will send help in case of an emergency. Joy's version of a better future fits into one small compact lipstick. All you do is take one of these test strips, put a drop of alcohol on it, and it will tell you if your drink is safe. Two lines is safe, one line is not safe. These drugs that are utilized are very easy to get, and if they are used, it only takes about 13 minutes for that drug to metabolize into the person's body. So what we know is that in 13 minutes, if someone's starting to feel off, they don't have a lot of time to, to call someone or to even figure out what's going on. You can right away actually push the button on the base and this button is Bluetooth connected. It goes right to the app. In the United States, every minute, 20 people get assaulted by their partner. That's according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Those same statistics also show one in four women and one in seven men will be physically hurt by beatings, burnings, or strangulation by their partner. One in 10 women will be raped by their partner. Statistics that Joy says she can't stand around and do nothing about. What we really want to do is stop this in its tracks. We know not every sexual and domestic violence occurs with drug facilitation, but we know it happens a lot. And so we really want to really see this from all sides of sexual and domestic violence. It's a nuanced issue. An Iowa football team has a new member, but you won't find her in uniform. This four-legged friend can't play the game, but she is there for emotional support. Brendan Jones has her story. If you've ever been to a Yotes practice, you might have seen her. Meet Nala. Nala even sits here during practice, making sure the receivers are doing their foot drills right. To her owner, Coach Leon Ledeau, she's the MVP. Don't put that in there. <laughs> They're inseparable. I know people say it, but she is like my friend <laughs> more, than, more than anything else. She's always there. She's 
comforting, she's loving, she's a goofball. Nala was supposed to be Lido's service dog, but her personality just didn't make the cut. But she can't pass the test because she's too friendly. Shortly after he was hired at C of I, Nala joined the team. She's had a football in her paws ever since. She's never known any other life outside of football, so this is, this is her day to day every single day. She may spend a lot of time with the guys on the field, but she appreciates her girl time too. Just ask Clarissa Alexander. And Nala's been my buddy for two years now. Alexander is the team's athletic trainer, and she knows Nala brings a healing touch to all the athletes. That's a large part of what our job has become, is emotional support. and. Having her here just cheers everybody up. It was helpful to have her there and just like, you know, bring that positive energy when um, you might not be so positive about like what's happening with injury wise. Nala has left her paw on the program and Ladeau wouldn't want it any other way. I almost now can't imagine why you would have like an athletic program or sports team and you wouldn't have a dog. You wouldn't want to have a Nala or something. A best friend to the team. Well, UNCP Athletics doesn't have any team pets that we know of, but Deshaun Donald is going to tell us what's been going on with our teams, who all seem to have a spectacular homecoming. That's right. Bring out your brooms, because Brave Nation's got a homecoming suite. Braves Wrestling and Basketball also hosted some preseason fun for the fans last week. Stay tuned for CNT Sports with Deshaun Donald. What's up, Braves Nation? I'm Deshaun Donald, and this is what happened during UNCP's homecoming weekend. Braves football hosted West Liberty University Saturday in the drizzling rain. After giving up 70 points the week before, Braves defense bounced back in dominant fashion, holding the Hilltoppers to a single field goal for the afternoon. The Braves offense posted 136 yards through the air and added 87 yards on the ground, including a 70-yard touchdown run by Zachariah Adams Duckerson, who scored the first points in the game. Senior quarterback Josh Jones got the Braves into the end zone twice. A two-yard run in the first quarter and a six-yard pass to tight end Fahim Diab in the fourth quarter. They led the Braves to their seventh straight homecoming win with a score of 24-3. After the game, Coach Richardson shared an inspirational message with his team. We are a good football team. I told you this this week. I told you before the game. We got to see ourselves in the right light. But the next two games, hey, we got a chance to do something really special, okay? We're going to go on the road, and we're going to face whatever people think about them being the best team in the conference, okay? And we're going to play well, and we're going to beat them, man. Yeah. Yeah. The Braves swimming team also had a homecoming event when they hosted Barton College and Emory University in a tri-meet Saturday. The Braves defeated both teams overall, but squeaked past Emory by just a single point. 131 to 130. The Braves finally defeated Barton College 161 to 91. Junior Mariel Mencia Martinez secured first place victories in the 50 and 100 yard freestyle events, as well as the 100 yard butterfly. It was three freshmen who finished first in the 100 yard breaststroke, 100 yard backstroke, and the 200 yard individual melody. Junior Kathleen Rodriguez Martos placed first in the 200 yard breaststroke. The Braves also finished first in the 400-yard freestyle relay. The Braves will be back in on action November 18th when they travel to Cary to compete in the Williams Peace Invitational. Braves soccer started Conference Carolina's tournament play on Saturday when they hosted Emmanuel College in quarterfinal play. In a very even matchup, the Braves fell down 1-0 after a goal by the Lions in the ninth minute and trailed for the rest of the game until junior Ashley Harris scored on the equalizer in the 90th minute. She sent the game into the first of two overtime periods, but overtime wasn't enough for either team to clinch the victory, so next up was the penalty style shootout. After both sides connected on their first four attempts and missed on the fifth, senior Naomi Fountain lasered a shot past the Lions goalie, and the fans were all over it. After the game, Coach Anderson spoke about his, mental, his team's mental prowess and determination to send it into overtime to find the equalizer with 41 seconds left in the second half. I mean, it shows tremendous mental fortitude. And I think 
uh, these players want to be challenged, and I wasn't happy, Coach Padilla was not happy at halftime, and we, we quite frankly, uh, uh, challenge them. Do you want to win this game? This is important to you, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, that response to, to to stay with the game plan, to stay composed and score. I mean, to actually finish with 41 seconds. Like with 41 seconds, like you miss that shot, it goes wide. The keeper takes 25 seconds off the clock, just going to get the ball. She she takes a goal kick. They, you win the 50-50, game's over with. So to finish there just uh, it is incredible. Braves Volleyball added a pair of wins to their record over the weekend, securing a share of the Conference Carolinas East Division regular season title in the process. On Friday, the Braves celebrated senior night by defeating Belmont Abbey three sets to zero. The Braves matched their season best 13 service aces while forcing Belmont Abbey into 20 total attack errors. On, the home, on homecoming, the Braves defeated North Greenville three sets to two. The Braves shot a .246 hit in percentage, racking up 11 service aces and four blocks. Senior Morgan Gibbs tallied 56 assists, two service aces, 16 digs, and three kills. It was a performance that earned her Conference Carolina's Specialist of the Week honors. Back to earlier in the week, the Braves basketball teams hosted Moonlight Madness as a showcase for the fans. Introducing their new rosters, the team show, showed off their, in their respective scrimmages, both the women and men's getting in on action. The night featured a dunk contest with judges including Bravehawk and a free tuition challenge for some lucky students. The men's teams will see some real action on November the 12th and 13th during the conference challenge here at home. The women are playing tonight at High Point University. Good luck, ladies. The Braves wrestling team held their annual black and gold scrimmage on Wednesday. Giving their fans a preview of what's to come this season, the Braves showcased 14 intra-squad duels in a new King of the Mat competition, plus a throws competition. The black squad found themselves victorious, coming ahead 67 to 49. The team starts regular season action on Sunday when wrestlers from half a dozen schools compete in the 41st annual Pembroke Classic here in the Jones Center. The Braves golf team will be in action today as they compete in the Converse Fall Invitational. The opening round was canceled yesterday due to inclement weather, weather, so that will be a round one event. Good luck to the five who are on the course today, and that's all for Braves Sports. Jay and Victor, it's back to you. Thanks, Deshaun. Well, we're out of here. I'm Victor Mays. And I'm Jay Lockbeer. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.